Thank you for inviting me, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here. And the first thing I want to say is really to address your talk, because um, in dance movement therapy, I'm a dance movement therapist and psychologist, and in dance movement therapy, we have a manual from Rena Kornblum. Um, it's called Disarming the Playground, and it's wonderful, because it works in movement with the children towards the same goals that you have. And uh, they just start by really, what is my space? What is your space? What is my kinesphere? And in order to not, you know, be intrusive. And so it's very helpful if you want movement-based or want to add movement-based work. And I just wanted to recommend that. Yeah, yeah. And also for... Yeah, yeah. It's also great to work with the stuff. Um, it's... They can implement it, and yeah, it's, so it's Rena Kornblum, and it's on the web, and you can order it. It's a manual. It's wonderful. It's for all ages. Yeah. So, um, okay. And the second thing I wanted to do is also a pre thing to my actual presentation because yesterday I realized that I should maybe talk a little bit about what dance movement therapy is actually doing in terms of um, trauma treatment. And I have not been working with children, but I have been working with women um, who uh, were um, victims to trauma and um, to very early assault, um, mostly of sexual nature, and who were in the clinic and who were in outpatient center and had been treated for dissociative identity disorder, formerly called multiple personality disorder. And that's what I want to do before I actually go into the method of the KMP. Um, and that's why I brought her. <laughs> Because in these groups, um, well, actually, let me, let me tell you just one more piece of information, and that's relating to what Bob was talking about yesterday. Um, in the psychiatric hospitals, we mostly find women um, who have suffered trauma because women, and he made this example yesterday, women tend to internalize the aggression, and they tend to turn the aggression towards themselves, and they tend to self-harm, and that's why most of them end up in the psychiatric hospitals, whereas men who have suffered trauma and abuse, they often turn the aggression outward, and they become perpetrators themselves, and then they more often end up in the prisons than in the psychiatric hospitals, and it's much more difficult for them to get actual treatment um, for, you know, for example, dissociative identity disorder than for the women. So uh, this is an important piece of information, I think, and that's why in this group that I hopefully going to show you a little piece of, um, there are mostly women in the in the group. Um, so what we are trying to teach the women um, in dance movement therapy is to really not internalize their aggression, but to externalize their aggression. And uh, we have used this little puppet to, to really symbolize that. And she's the boxing nun, so she's a, good, she's a good girl, but she is externalizing her aggression, and she can do it. She can use real strength to fight. Oh, that, that one didn't work anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, that's a principle, and it's not only a symbolic principle, because there are these body feedback effects that when you really do it, you know, you do, you, you imagine the perpetrator, you address him, you really use strength, then there's body feedback that's coming back to you, and it really changes something on the level of emotions and on the level of cognitions also. So um, it's not only a symbolic thing. Um, yeah, and uh, I thought I'd just show you a very little piece of a session of dance movement therapy which we did with these women. This was actually a while ago, and it also was in the United States. Um, so, um, and uh, it was a core therapy for them in that hospital, and that was because the program director of that dissociative identity unit, um, he was actually married to a dance therapist. And that's how it came that dance movement therapy was a really core discipline in that treatment. But it really helped uh, these women greatly because they had a means of expressing themselves on the nonverbal level and of integrating the parts and pieces of themselves, which is the goal in, in dissociative identity disorder treatment, um, on, from a body level. Um, and because every trauma is also happening on the body level, it's also really important to treat it from the body level, from the sensory level, and not only from the talking. And that's what we're trying to achieve. 
So I want to show you just this little piece of an example of how we can work in dance movement therapy. And this is a form of dance movement therapy that is actually um, a blend of um, authentic movement because the patient who is initiating the movement, and this is this patient, at this moment in time, you can also forward it like a minute or a half a minute. Let's forward it a half a minute. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, before we actually look at this, I need your agreement to not, that no, nothing of this data exits this room. Please lift your hand if you can agree to that, everybody. Please, everybody, personal data, not leaving this room, N not forgetting this, this is very important. Um, okay, so this patient initiates and she's supposed to just go into an authentic movement and um, so that's why she closes her eyes and um, is focusing on her inner and expresses the inner to the outer. And the rest of the group is actually following her. They are attentively picking up what she's doing and they are trying to follow her, not so much in all of the shapes she's doing, but more in the qualities that she is transmitting. And um, the therapist of this group is Edith Baum, um, B-A-U-M. Um, and uh, she was um, 81 years old when I was working with her. I was actually taping the session, so I'm not in the picture. But uh, she's standing here. Yeah, that was her. Um, and um, this is a mix of authentic movement and Chasian method because it's participatory. Everybody participates in the sessions and later on they sit down and talk about their experience while they were with that patient. So we take turns and then afterwards you talk for like 20 minutes or so. This is a patient and that's interesting. Um, she described her dissociation in the way that she said, you know, I'm in one part of my brain and I can't exit. I can't enter another part of my brain. And when Shai was giving his presentation yesterday, it made sense to me. It made a lot of sense to me. So it's really important to listen to our patients and then, you know, go from there. This is also a patient with a strong resting tremor, but when she started to move, you, can't, you couldn't see her tremor anymore. It's similar to what happens to the Parkinson patients we work with, that they, in movement, they get into a flow where they don't have these symptoms. <coughs> That gave you just a short impression of um, how it, we work in movement. And um, it, um, the patients were very appreciative of this form of movement therapy. And it, they really said it's a, it's a wonderful, um, it's just as valuable as the talk to their psychoanalyst. It was an analytical clinic. Um, and it works on a different level. And that's the wonderful thing about movement, that it really works on a different level, that you can reach people that you can't reach verbally, and so on. Oh. Uh, I didn't hear, what was the purpose of the other people following? Them? Yeah, the purpose of the other people. So see, I, I just have to say two more sentences. So the people, um, the, the patients often brought their own music with them. Um, so they were already sometimes doing this at home in order to know, okay, what, how far do I want to go this time in the therapy with my movement and what I want to express. So many of them were really prepared. They brought their music. Others didn't. They selected music there. They said, okay, today I want an upbeat music. Today I want a, um, another music. You know. um, 
And then uh, the purpose of the other people following is that they, they really step into the shoes of that one patient for a moment. And uh, the amount of empathy that creates is incredible. So if you sit down later on, and the, this patient, for example, she said, oh, yes, I know. And it was all this. Um, she felt a lot of helplessness, depression. Um, um, and uh, she didn't remember that there were resourceful movements. You've seen that movement when she had her hands on her back, and then she broke free. And she couldn't remember that. And then the other patient said, but there was this movement when you broke free. And so she remembered, and so she could see her resources, and they could support each other in this really um, um, beautiful way um, uh, after, afterwards when they were talking about it. So this is to increase empathy and understanding and to increase the support of the group um, and of, yeah, of the therapy. So thank you for watching. I just thought I'd bring that so you get an impression of what we actually do because sometimes it's really like um, not very transparent, you know, to some people, for, for example, from the ministry, um, what you can do with dance movement therapy. Um, okay, uh, now let's switch over to um, measurement instruments that we use in dance movement therapy. And I have studied the Kestenberg movement profile, and this is a very, um, this is, the most complex movement observation instrument I think that we have in movement therapy. Um, and it really, also for the intensive class, you need 36 hours to learn it. So don't even try to understand everything of it. I will try to guide you through it a little bit and the possibilities that you actually have with it. Um, Judith Kestenberg was a psychiatrist, a Jewish psychiatrist. She was born in Poland. And in the time of the World War II, she had to flee. She went to New York, which, that's where she lived for the rest of her life. But she also came to London to study with Anna Freud. So she was a psychoanalyst, and that's how she built her theory. She learned a lot about Mlaban movement analysis, and she studied with um, Emgard Batenyev and Warren Lamb and everybody else who was working then in New York on movement analysis. And um, she put it together with the system of Anna Freud in order to do an integration um, and actually a system that is a theory on movement and psychological meaning. So movement and meaning, she related that um, in, a, in a beautiful way. It's a very um, systematic system um, and we're still um, doing empirical research to validate it and to look at its reliabilities and uh, there's a little bit of data on that also. Um, and uh, we know a little bit now, but we have to do more research on the entire theory and the theory system. Okay, so um, I think, I think I've said all this. I've said this. Ah, I wanted to give you another example of the spatial, well maybe we can come back to that later. So this is Judith Kestenberg, and her system is the Kestenberg Movement Profile, and um, I'm going to talk mainly about the rhythms, which is just one of the nine profiles that we actually do um, with the Kestenberg Movement Profiling. It's for the assessment. It can be used for the assessment of children at risk. It can be used for other assessments. It's a very broad range. It's a developmental system that uh, Judith Kestenberg did the same thing as Piaget. She followed three children very, very closely through the, when, from when they were born to the age 20 to look at the movement developments that uh, come in movement, uh, the, yeah, the, the development that comes in movement. And that's the way she actually developed her system. And then they did a lot of moving the single movement um, uh, qualities uh, in the SensePoint study group um, in order to really get it through their body, into their body, through their bodies, and um, to use the wisdom of the body to, you know, to create it in, in the end. <coughs> um, it has, it looks at 64 movement parameters that can also come in combination, so it really has a lot of um, uh, things, uh, the theoretical background I already gave you. And um, it's a theory system in its own right. I've been saying that it clinically helps you in diagnosis and intervention planning um, for adults and children. It's uh, mostly applied in the area of anal analyzing parent-child interaction. 
that's how Judith Kastmark uh, used it for her lo lifelong. She founded the Center for Parents and Children in order to look at um, the interaction on the nonverbal level with the children while they were still nonverbal and how the parents react to them. And um, in order to just identify like vicious circles and movement or things that didn't fit and in order to identify what, uh, what works well and in order to work on problems that uh, parents had with their nonverbal children and to understand their needs. And actually that's also one of the main purpose um, to understand the needs of the children uh, while they're still nonverbal because they express themselves in movement very well. They're very eloquent in movement. And um, most parents understand that intuitively and that's fine. Um, but sometimes there are problems and then you can really look at it in a systematic way. Um, and so it's really also very helpful for the very small children that are at risk um, and understanding their utterances that are not verbal but in movement. Um, she has uh, a system that looks at movement qualities and movement shape. And I'm actually going to go to the next. So uh, this is the profile as it comes out once you have finished a profile for one person. Um, and uh, it looks at movement rhythm, which is one very basic dimension. The first movement rhythm that we have in life is the sucking rhythm. It's also a reflex when we are born. We are already um, doing sucking, and sucking is a rhythmic movement. It has a rhythm to it. Um, so I will talk about other rhythms later. And then the movement attributes, which are the changes between um, how do I go from one rhythm to another? Do I go gradually or do I go in an abrupt way? So this is related to temperament of the child, actually. Um, so while the rhythms are really about the needs of the child, the attributes are about the temperament of the child. Then we have the pre-efforts. Pre-efforts are particularly interesting because they are related to learning styles in children in movement, but they are also related to um, defense mechanisms. So if you want to assess the defense mechanisms in movement of your patient, you can use the Kastenberg movement profile with the pre-effort profile in order to do that. Um, and then we have the efforts, which are the full movement qualities, the mastered movement qualities, which are about coping in movement. So. Can I relate fully to time, space, weight, and all the other um, dimensions that I have in movement? And then there's the other side, the shape flow side. And why I was so fascinated with your first slide was because this is the intrapersonal side that we've just been talking about, and the other one is the interpersonal side. So now we're coming to the shape flow. And this just corresponded in movement so nicely to what you were saying um, in, uh, for, for the verbal part. Okay, so um, then we have the shape flow, and the shape flow is really about growing and shrinking, um, and it starts from breathing, because when you breathe in, you grow, and when you breathe out, you shrink, right? So um, shape flow are the very small movements that we do. If you enter a room and there's a good atmosphere, um, then you grow a little bit, and that's the shape flow. You just grow a little bit. If you exit the room and there's sun outside and it's nice and warm and not so hot as today, um, then you grow a little bit. And if there's cold weather and a storm coming and a wind, you shrink a little bit, right? So this is shape flow. This is our reactions that we do. And children do have them already. And so we can actually look at them and see how they feel in their general environment, even the small baby in the cradle, and um, towards one stimulus. And that's the unipolar shape flow. So uh, do they grow towards when the mother comes down to them or do they shrink away? And the parents actually use that as cues that you, to know when the child is overstimulated or understimulated. And usually that works fine. That just works on an intuitive basis. If the child shrinks away from you, okay, you let them go a little bit. You let them recover and then you start over again with your interaction or communication. So it's very basic. Uh, Kesselberg was a genius, really. I mean, really. I, I, this is a, such a wonderful um, instrument. Um, everybody should really learn about it. Um, so bipolar shape flow and unipolar shape flow. And then we have shaping and directions where you go out um, and you build bridges to other people, for example, by you know saying hello or reaching out. Uh, but you can also be defensive. You can say stop. Hmm? It's very important in the bullying debate. 
And then there's the three-dimensional relating, uh, shaping in planes, like embracing somebody or whatever it's three-dimensional relating. And these are all interrelated, so you can see whether there is a correspondence from the tension flow side and the shape flow side, whether the um, person actually intrapersonally has the possibilities to um, express what they sense internally um, in the um, according shape, so if there are affinities or if there are clashes in that um, inter already in inner personal for one person. But then also if you go to two profiles, so you make a profile of the mom and a profile of the child, you can see very tediously, because there are six categories in each profile, where these profiles correspond, where there are affinities, where there is attunement also in their um, interaction, and where there are clashes. So this is very useful on the intrapersonal as well as on the interpersonal level. Oh, and um, from up to down, it goes to the more conscious. So the rhythms and the shape flow, they are completely on the unconscious level usually. I mean, you can, if you think about what rhythm am I using, and you're sitting in your chair and you're using this, this is a biting rhythm in the food, you can put it to the conscious level. But usually it's really unconscious. We're doing this, we're doing curling of the hair, for example, in oral rhythm. And uh, that's a self-soothing, actually. An oral rhythm is always for self-soothing. In trauma groups, you often can um, observe that people are doing the um, oral rhythm when somebody is telling something disturbing in the group, some kind of trauma or assault. Then other people start rocking in this way with their upper body. So you can even see it in almost full body, an oral rhythm that people use in order to self-soothe, in order to calm themselves down. Okay, so this is from the unconscious to the conscious movements. So the efforts, that's what we see in the dancer, on the stage. This is the, I know what I'm doing then, right? And um, the same thing is valid for the other side, that this is from up to down, from the unconscious to the conscious movement. And on this side, we have the movement qualities, tension flow, smooth versus sharp reversals, indulgent versus fighting qualities. Actually, this is interesting, because um, <laughs> the PAMA group, the mirror neuron researchers in PAMA, they have connected, Rizzolatti has connected, had connected to Stern when he was still alive, in the late stage, and now Rizzolatti is actually doing a research on fighting qualities versus indulgent qualities and comparing their effects and interaction on a neural level. So this will be a really interesting result for us in movement therapy because they are doing it from the neuroscience side now. Okay, and then there's movement shape and the shape flow, and I've said that's growing versus shrinking, basically. So all reactions that are connected to well-being, to our well-being. And uh, there's always the first development in the first year, development in the second year, and development in the third year in these three planes. And we get uh, six measures. So the first year, that's the horizontal movement plane, second year, vertical movement plane, third year, sagittal movement plane. And so you get six measures for these planes. And uh, these are actually then plots that you just do a profile on in the end. So that's how it technically works. This is the rhythms curve of a um, two and a half month old baby. What we do when we do rhythms writing is we just draw a timeline or we draw several timelines and then you observe the baby. This is about six minutes observation and what you do is you use your kinesthetic empathy. You look at the baby and every time the baby increases its tension you write down and every time the baby decreases the tension, you write up. So you, you use your pencil as a seismograph, basically, in order to draw the rhythm slime from what happens in the body of the baby in terms of tensing and relaxing the muscles. And um, that technique is um, something that I think that is very valuable because it does not only give you um, categorical data, it really gives you continuous data and with continuous data in uh, statistical analysis, for example, we can do a lot more than just with categorical data because we have any point in time. Three, four minutes? Okay, I will try. 
Okay, let me jump over a couple of things because of course I, oh, this is Daniel Stern who republished this system in his book of 2012 with the vitality effects. He actually described what Kestenberg was doing and he was aware of the work of Kestenberg. He was reading it, but in this place he doesn't refer to her. That's why I'm a little bit angry with him. <laughs> um, just another example how we use rhythm in communication all the time. When you are saying goodbye to a dear friend, you often do an embrace, right? And in the beginning, you're doing a smooth rhythm, a smooth reversals. And once the embrace is getting too long or long enough, it was long enough, you start with that padding or tapping rhythm, which is a fighting rhythm, it's sharp reversals. And the other person usually understands that this means, okay, time to separate now, you know? But some people don't understand, but yeah, that's sometimes another issue. Yeah. At wonderful. We did a natural observation in train stations and at the campus Mensa where the people eat. And we actually noted that gender differences, that, that gender difference that in the mixed couples and in the female couples, it was exactly like that. And when two men embraced, they started right away with that rhythm. <laughs> and that's the, probably the homophobia in our Western societies. I don't know. <laughs> very, very good observation. Because usually that's on the unconscious level, really. I mean, we do it, but we're not really giving, we're not really, you know, consciously thinking about it. Okay, so these are the 10 prototypical rhythms. I don't have time to get into that. We will have a workshop on Wednesday where we will have a little more time to do that in movement, and that would be nice. Um, I hope that if you get interested, you can join that workshop. So this is also, these rhythms are also showing in songs. All the lullabies around the globe, they use an underlying sucking rhythm if you write what happens in the tension. So that's really interesting, but uh, yeah. So it relates to music. It's not only a dance movement therapy thing, but it's, it can be, the, there can be projects on rhythms between the arts therapists. And it also, so I'm just putting these uh, musics that uh, the rhythms relate to. It also, you can also analyze it in art because here in the Van Gogh you see there's a lot of twisting rhythm in the sky and there's biting rhythm with which he did the cornfields. So just the example how that goes across the art therapies, that's is really important, I think. And now let me really move. Uh, there's a lot more to say also on the validity and Navalotan, who did wonderful research on the objectivity and the reliability. Um, so you can all look that up in the slides. And, oh, fetal movement notation, because also the babies use the rhythms before they are born, so you can actually look at temperament and stuff like that before uh, Susan Lohman did that. Communicative rhythms, the embraces I already told you about. We did a lot of research on these things, also with quite nice samples um, experimentally. Um, and uh, Judith Kestenberg was also working on child survivors of the Holocaust. I just wanted you all to know that because she has several books out on child survivors of the Holocaust. Um, it's very interesting also in terms of our debate. Now we have measurement instruments for refugee children because there are many refugees from Syria and Germany. And, hmm? But this is what I wanted to get to. So how do you use it? It looks so complicated. <laughs> Um, this is a profile of a boy. This is a profile of his mother. In the boy, he is four and a three quarters of years old. So he's actually working on, the, on that level here in a genital rhythms, which is swaying. Um, and you can see that in his profile, he sees has, a, has a lot of swaying. Actually, the swaying rhythm is to take care of other people, um, basically. And, um, the mom has an interesting rhythms profile. And if we look at that, we don't need to understand much, but we understand that there's a lot of sucking. That's the O, the oral, oral sucking. It looks really wild because usually you would expect a baby to have the sucking rhythm in that amount of, you know. And then <coughs> there's the second profile, which is the attributes. From the attributes, you can actually see how often a person is in neutral flow. Neutral flow is an area where you don't very much between tensing and relaxing. It's just this very lifeless. Um, we can observe in the boy 
that there is a lot of neutral flow in him, 33%. This gives us a hint. If there's more than 30% of neutral flow, it is a hint for depression in a person. <coughs> Pre-efforts, he has a lot. He has a lot of um, efforts. That's fine. His profile looks good, except for that part, really. Um, the mom, she has almost no efforts. She has a lot of free effort. She's a lot in her defenses in the movement. Free effort, vehement, sudden, but not with the efforts. With the effort, she has four actions. You can't even analyze that because you need 10 to analyze it reliably. Um, OK, let's not look at the shape flow side. That's interesting, too. Um, so what happened here is that the mom is um, drug dependent. She is actually an alcoholic. And um, the boy, he's taking care of her. And you can see that he has a lot of maturity here. He's taking care of her because she's very needy. She has a lot of oral rhythms. But he is taking care of her well, but to the expense that he's really showing signs of depression. Um, and you can see that all in the movement profile. And you can use it when you assess trauma. A friend of mine was working in the Philadelphia healthcare system for court. And he was in the families where there was, you know, abuse and stuff. And you can actually, with the shape flow, you can show how often does a child in a family situation approach or avoid another adult. How often to the mom, how often to the dad. Um, so you have a means to quantify what usually is just intuitive. You say, oh, he always avoids his dad, but you don't have any data. Here you can generate data about that, and you can count how often he, did he do that and which plane did he do that. So you have a lot more detailed movement analysis information. <laughs> and I have to stop. Um, and that's um, how you can use it and what, can, what it can be useful for in assessing children at risk. So thank you so much for your attention. Do I have more? <laughs>